such a pleasure for us to have Marina Warner with us at this literature festival. This is your second visit, and uh, I must say that we're so honored and so pleased to have us to well, have you here with us. Well, I'm delighted. I couldn't be happier, especially <laughs> as it's full moon. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So before turning to your fiction, I'd like to ask you a few questions on fairy tales and also on myths. You've written extensively on fairy tales, on who narrated them, or who told them, why they were being told, and who was listening to them. So what is the staying power of fairy tales? I know this is a huge question, but why do we keep reading fairy tales? Well, I think one of the uh, things that most surprised me since I first started uh, looking at them as a kind of scholar rather than as a child reader and then a grown-up reader um, is that they actually have grown in their status. People refer to fairy tale material, to fairy tale structures. They take them much more seriously than they did 40 years ago. So that it's actually more, it's not my sort of interpretation of their hold, but the sort of ev evidence of, their, of, of this um, way that they offer a language of the imagination that crosses borders. And I think one of the things that has become you know, it, it's very important about being somewhere like Malta is that we are in a crossing point of through time and geographically, um, which is actually very one of the things I was very struck by because the world is in such crisis now. I was very struck while I've been here that um, the language, you know, has these different strata in it. And quite honestly, that is very similar to what happens with a body of storytelling like fairy tale. It, it is not actually particularly anchored in any dialect or any language or any particular culture. I like to think of fairy tales as sometimes as a tune. So Hansel and Gretel or Red Riding Hood is a tune. You know the tune. You all know the tune. And then we can play the tune on a penny whistle or a guitar or in a symphony orchestra. We could set it for a huge, huge piece. So that it is, it, and, and that is not anchored in any particular, it's not, it doesn't, it isn't confined. So I think that one of the reasons, it's only one of the reasons for the rise of fairy tale, is that there is a yearning, or the rise of interest in fairy tale, is that there is a yearning for some kind of lingua franca, mm -hmm. of emotions, passions, inquiry. And I, you know, I often say that the root, the word story, Myths and fairy tales are both forms of story, and we can look at the distinctions between them which exist. But, um, but the word story is related to the word in Greek for inquiry. Mm -hmm. And stories are methods, forms of inquiry. And they often are forms of inquiry into very difficult, difficult topics, which is why you get, in myth and in fairy tale, you get extremes of emotion and extremes of aberration. So you get Medea killing her children, you get Oedipus marrying his mother, um, and you get uh, children being, a uh, father cutting off his daughter's hands um, in Grimm, or any number of, you know, quite a, and then there is, you have to, one has to also accept that, and Aristotle noticed it, you know, in the, pretty much the first page of the Poetics, that we as a species are attracted to the unpleasant when it's represented. Mm -hmm. Things that would disgust us, repel us, terrify us, if they happen to us in reality, when we actually experience them filtered and represented through art. It's not that they're changed, some art changes, but it's just the act of representation, the act of mimesis of some kind, mm -hmm. of thoughtful inquiry through story or poetry. Um, through language can actually make that experience confrontable, not understandable, not entirely tolerable, but nevertheless we get some kind of pleasure from it, from getting closer to understanding it. And despite uh, the violence or the cruel element in both fairy tales and myths, they also have, as you rightly point out, uh, in Six Myths of Our Time, and From the Beast to the Blonde, fairy tales, and also myths, have the power 
to save or to, there's a power of salvation, the salvific power of fairy tales and also of myths. They also have the power to heal. Can you tell us something yes. about yes. that? Well, I, I'm very fond of Italo Calvino, um, who is, um, and he, he in, in his great book, uh, Invisible Cities, mm -hmm. um, the great Khan says at one point to Marco Polo, who's weaving a whole lot of stories about imaginary cities, the Invisible Cities is the title, um, and he says, why are you telling me all these consolatory fables? And, um, and, the, and Marco Polo answers a little bit later in the book, um, he says that in order to see um, how much uh, light, in order to see any light that is possible, one must peer into the darkness. Mm -hmm. and, then, and something, there's something about, I mean, stories come, the, 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 um, that feeling of consolation that comes, the satisfaction that comes from a well-written novel or a well-told fairy tale um, is actually extraordinarily difficult to analyze. And I, and I, you know, it belongs to all this kind of aesthetic, mm -hmm. the aesthetic experience um, of confronting something which we wouldn't want to experience in real life, as I said before. But one of the main differences between myth and fairy tale is that fairy tale tends to be defined by the uplift at the end. It's not always the case. I mean, mm -hmm. Red Riding Hood, a very, very famous fairy tale, ends with the wolf-eating little girl in its earliest printed version, the Perrault version. Later, it gets changed, and the huntsman comes along and liberates Granny and the little girl from the belly of the wolf. So that's the happy ending. Um, and in a way, I think you ha you, one can say that a major difference between myth and fairy tale is that in, in a myth by Ovid, a metamorphosis is not reversible. You know, when Io is turned into a cow, I'm afraid she, that Actaeon is turned into a, you know, a hound, he is torn apart uh, into a stag, he's torn apart, sorry, into a hind, a stag, he's torn mm -hmm. apart by his hounds, um, and he can't speak to them mm -hmm. because he's imprisoned Voice. in animal mm -hmm. form, and that is the end of Actaeon, except that he's metamorphosed later into a, you know, some, sometimes the metamorphosis becomes a flower or a star, but you don't retain your human form. You don't get perfected again as a human being in a mythic metamorphosis. In a fairy tale metamorphosis, you will be reversed. The frog prince will be returned to his human form. Yes. And Don donkey skin in her, mm -hmm. covered in her horrible ass, smelling ass hide will shed her ass hide and she will become the princess that she should be. So that is the, that is the dynamic of fairy tale towards happiness. And it was one of the reasons that fairy tale was ranked much lower than myth mm -hmm. and also considered to be you know, trash for, you know, sentimental trash to, to um, give consolation to the illiterate. This is the, the general view of it because it offered this kind of hope wishing on a star and it's very prone to being exploited commercially. I mean, we've seen it in Disney. I mean, I'm not saying that it's always, um, it's always powerful, but to my, I mean, I think that the recognitions that end some fa famous fairy tales, when the, the Cinderella story, when the wronged, the wronged girl is finally recognized for her goodness, for her beauty, for her kindness, and the beauty can be moral beauty, not physical beauty, um, that, that there is a true, uh, there is a message there of hope and consolation and some very great thinkers, you know, I mean, Walter Benjamin in his mm -hmm. famous essay, The Storyteller, he praises the fairy tale mode for its cunning and high spirits and for the fact that it has this heroic optimism that it, whatever is happening, you know, what, however ground down you are, the story lifts you with that ray of hope that somehow there will be justice. Yes, I should mention that, that, that often justice is the, 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 the downfall of the tyrant, the downfall of the oppressor, the unmasking of the abuser. These are the things that fairy tale promises. And yet, in the filmic retellings, in contemporary filmic retellings of fairy tales, as you point out in Once Upon a Time, fairy tales are becoming darker, more somber, which you say is the reason why fairy tales are now uh, being transformed into myth. Yes, they're, they're emerging a bit more. I mean, I think one of the reasons is that um, general knowledge of mythology is weakening. 
so and, mm -hmm. and doesn't belong quite in the same sort of classical civilization. And we have so much popular culture now in different forms from games shows. I mean, when I was, when my son was young, it was Dungeons and Dragons. But Tolkien, Dungeons and Dragons, game shows, game, um, computer games, videos, graphic novels, they tend to meld a lot of material. I mean, the, and some of them are really good. I mean, they're not at all. I mean, someone like Neil Gaiman knows a lot of mythology. Terry Pratchett knew a lot of mythology. You know, and, um, and th in their works, you know, J.K. Rowling also, mm -hmm. who did classics mm -hmm. as a student, also, but she mixes everything up. So you're not getting the same, she's got a lot of mythology mm -hmm. in there, and also in Harry Potter, and also a lot of fairy lore. You know, from different layers of British, the British Isles, and other other places. So you're getting a kind of a very eclectic, new supernatural that's highly mm -hmm. populated by all kinds of blow-ins and imports. And what about the misogynist element in fairy tales? Uh, because paradoxically, it is precisely the misogynist element in fairy tales which enabled female authors of fairy tales to rebel against uh, this patriarchal or this misogynist element. We're in a, I mean, it, this relates to your point about dark, the darkening uh, mood of fairy tale. A lot of actresses who are now reaching their kind of middle years mm -hmm. uh, have become very interested in playing the negative parts. So a very good example would be Angelina Jolie, Jolie and, Maleficent. And, and Maleficent. So she chose to play the, part, the role of the Wicked Queen in a version of Snow White. Um, and she gives a very interesting twist to the plot, which I won't give away in case some of you <laughs> haven't seen it, because it's really very interesting. She's the producer of the film, and she created it as a vehicle for herself. And she's by no means the only one uh, who wants to play these mature women um, who are malevolent, maleficent, um, in the material. And that's sort of the current stage of the feminist um, res response. You see, Jennifer Lee, who's the screenwriter of Frozen, mm -hmm. uh, identifies herself as second generation feminist. We can all argue about how feminist <laughs> Frozen is, and we can argue about how feminist its effects are on the many, many little girls who are absolutely obsessed with it. <laughs> because I don't know if it happens here in Malta, but certainly <laughs> all over England they are wearing Elsa dresses, and they do their Frozen dance, <laughs> in, in which, with a wave of the hand, they freeze the world. And um, and um, so, uh, it's, uh, but the darkening mood is that is in relation to, it has, a, it, has a, um, it has a logistical element, and that is that the market has now split. With the, run, with the rise of interest in fairy tale, there is now a market for adult fairy tale. So you get a lot of adult fairy tale material being told in film and in novels. Mm -hmm. So from uh, Margaret Atwood, Angela Carter onwards, Alice Smith, um, yes. uh, uh, Helen or Ye Yimi, mm -hmm. we now have very, very grown up material novel, novels that are related to Bluebeard or Beauty and the Beast or whatever. And then the children's market still exists as well. So, but in the adult market, you get darkness, very, very deep darkness sometimes. Um, yeah. You're very interested in magic and shape-shifting and the transmigration of subjectivity and selfhood. So I'd like to ask you a question on stranger magic, charmed states, and the Arabian Nights, and the perspective that you adopt uh, when writing this wonderful, this amazing work. Um, you write in your introduction that you drew on Borges mm. and his oxymoronic description of the greatest literature as that which displays reasonable imagination. Reasoned. Oh, sorry, reasoned yes, imagination. Yes, yes. Can you tell us why you would define this perspective as reasoned imagination? Well, it's in the preface, actually, to the... Um, it's Borges' preface to his friend, mm -hmm. Adolfo Bioy Casares' yes. marvelous book, The Invention of Morale. And, um, and it's just a throwaway phrase, but it actually explains a great deal of Borges' own work. And uh, the contrast, the oxymoron that you would describe, seems to me actually to be a false one. And interestingly, mm. cogni co cogni cognitive studies, I'm not 
terribly keen on, on neuroscientific descriptions mm -hmm. for literature and aesthetics, but nevertheless, in this case, I totally am delighted they've discovered this. They've discovered that if I say to you, I saw a mermaid today in the Blue Grotto, in where we went, in the mm -hmm. sea, you see it in your mind's eye. Okay. And then I say to you, well, actually, I saw a fisherman fish a dolphin fish out of the water. And you also see it in your mind's eye. That mind's eye is the same place in your brain. And they found that there's absolutely, though it has always been thought that when we remember, we do it in one part of our head, and when we imagine, we in do another. it in another, that is absolutely not the case. We have one organ of visualizing thought, and it's, you know, it happens in the same place, which is, I mean, it, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because when we read, after all, we construct numerous images from our reading, which have the quality of remembered. And if, when you get to my age, actually, and you've read as much as I have in terms of fiction, I have great difficulty in our remembering if I've experienced something for real or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, especially countries, especially places. Um, I really can't remember if I've been there or not. I mean, Venice to me is both entirely a city of the imagination. So there's a constant yes, interplay yes, between yes, invention yes. or falsehood and truth. It's not falsehood. It's not falsehood. It's, it's a, there, there are different forms of... And I think that it, it's... Um, I mean, obviously, I'm not saying that we should believe what we fantasize, and there's a whole range of difficulties, especially political difficulties, that go to that. But I think it's a very important first step to realize that the fantasticating mind is actually a reasoning mind. Mm -hmm. it's, and when you write, I mean, if we're talking about it from the practical point of view, the, 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 the fairy tales or the myth, mythological material, that, the Borges short stories or the Kafka short stories, Kafka is the absolute supreme example of this. Mm -hmm. Dante, you know, it, you can build in the Inferno from Dante. You could build it, it's the, it, I mean, and not only build it, but there's, you can take, it's got a clock. I mean, it could not be more reasoned. You know, the, every single element of yes. it is totally, totally mm -hmm. thought out. And yet, of course, it's a complete I mean, fabrication we, 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 or imagination. It, but we, it's hard for us actually to remember that. It's mm -hmm. hard to remember that Dante didn't experience it and it doesn't actually exist, but it doesn't, you know. That is a supreme <laughs> example of yeah. reasoned imagination. Yes, yes. So, so I think, and I think that it's, it's, it's interesting to try and look at it, to look at it as for what it gives us. And there are two important areas. One is that if we acknowledge how important it is in constructing realities that are not, as it were, verifiable or, or positive mm -hmm. in the world, then it, it warns us, it gives us, it, 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 it acts as a caution for how we are being affected all the time by these things that we do not know are like that. Mm -hmm. This is how our minds work, so we are actually very prone to thinking things are... So in a sense, my position is an enlightenment one. It's not a f I'm not on the side of, of total phantasmagoria. I'm, I'm trying to say that, that, you know, that we need to be aware more of how, how s sensitive we are to, the, to this element. But the other is that we can use it to create worlds. And that, to me, seems the true energy that you get in the great writers of fairy tale, which is that it, there is a utopian impulse. The utopian impulse. Now, the utopian impulse can be critical. I mean, in Kafka, it's critical, Cre clearly extremely critical. Um, but, in, but it can also be, in some of the children's writers, it's, it's, it's very, very festive. Mm -hmm. um, would you please read an excerpt from uh, this wonderful book uh, on uh, um, the Arabian I, I, Nights? Uh, right in, in the context of the translation workshop, um, I did actually hit a problem with writing a book about the Arabian Nights, which is that um, not only I can't read Arabic, but um, the book was first printed in French, and it would have meant, if I'd quoted from a translation, it would have meant my translating a translation and, or, or using a modern translation in Eng into English. And, I mean, so I decided that I wouldn't do that, that I would do what I think is a storyteller's strategy, which is that I would just retell the stories that I needed the reader to know when they were reading my account of the Arabian Nights. So I'll just give you one short example of a story. And um, it, it, it relates to my reasoned imagination um, point because this is a story about dreams. And um, in, um, is that my microphone? Okay. There won't be, 
There will be feedback on this, you know. Um, it's a story about dreams, and I think it's uh, the sort of dream knowledge as it's presented in the Arabian Nights is one of the reasons that the book appealed to the reader, its first readers in Europe in the 18th and ninth, principally the 19th centuries. Uh, there's a glimmer of some kind of truth here. A fortune regained. There's a lovely old house in Baghdad, built around a shaded and tiled courtyard with a square pool in the center where a small jet of water pulses. It resembles many others in that old city. Doves fly down from their dovecot in the heat of the day to rinse their dusty wings in the little pool, and the small lemon trees breathe honey. Baded wooden interlacings on the windows of the house, both those overlooking the street and those facing the courtyard, mottle the cool inner rooms. It's not unlike many other houses in that city. But to the owner, it wasn't like any of them. His mother had lived there till her death two years before, and over the decades she had added distinctive touches, a carving on the lintel of the kitchen quarters, with a special blessing for the bowls and dishes, pots and pans inside. His wife and daughters watered the potted flowers every morning in the courtyard and put out food for the birds at a table in the corner. In the days when this story unfolds, the house is falling to rack and ruin. The wooden shutters are missing beads and leaning on their hinges. The pump no longer pearls in the little pool. And nobody in the household thinks of feeding the birds, since they themselves have to scavenge to survive. After several difficult years, the owner's business has failed completely. He can't pay his servants, satisfy his creditors, or revive his trade and help his family. One night, in the depths of his despair, he dreamed. A form appeared in his bedroom, and a voice announced to him, as clearly as if the speaker were standing in the room at his very ear, if you want to know how to live, go to Cairo. So the ruined man set out from Baghdad for the Egyptian capital, and reaching it at nightfall, with no money to pay for a bed, he turned into a mosque and laid himself down to sleep. As he lay there, it so happened that a band of robbers entered the mosque to break into the adjoining house. But they were rough and wild and made such a clatter and commotion as they were trying to break in that they woke the inhabitants in the house who called the guards. They rushed to the scene. The robbers skedaddled on the instant so the guards found only the Baghdadi, whom they hauled before their chief, and he had him beaten. The, beaten was, the beating was so severe, the man's despair deepened, if that were possible, and he thought he would die of the wounds. Then they threw him into the cells. For three days he languished there before he was summoned to appear before the chief of police. The police chief demanded of the traveler, what brought you to Cairo? The man told him of his dream, adding ruefully that he'd now found a new way of life, which was to be beaten like an old donkey. At this, the chief of police roared with laughter so widely that the man could see down his gullet to the wisdom teeth at the back. When in due course, the chief of police recovered his composure. He said to the ruined man from Baghdad, I have dreams too. On several occasions, I've heard a voice telling me to go to Baghdad. There's an old house there, the voice says built around an inner courtyard and a little pool with a fountain. It must have been lovely, but now the whole place is dilapidated and abandoned. In my dream, someone shows me the house, the lemon trees in pots, the shadows cast by the shutters, and a funny prayer inscribed over the door to the kitchen asking for protection for the pots and pans. He began laughing heartily again. The voice tells me, under the threshold of the doorway there, a fortune is waiting for you. Go to Baghdad and know how to live. But I am not a fool like you. I am not going to bestir myself for a dream. Still merry, the policeman dribbled some small change into the ruined man's hands and told him to go home. The man from Baghdad took the money and traveled back as fast as he could. And when he reached his house, he called his family and hustled and they dug under the threshold of the kitchen quarters. And there was indeed a great fortune there, buried. So he was able to pay his creditors 
and re-engage his servants and start his business again and thrive till the end of his days when the master of graveyards and the destroyer of all joys came to fetch him. How weird and wonderful are the ways of destiny. So Marina, we can now turn to your fiction. You have written stories for children, you've written short stories, novels. What does story mean to you? Or rather, what do myths and fairy tales mean to you when you are actually producing them yourself, uh, revisiting them, inhabiting them, writing them rather than writing about, about them? Well, I think I do much more writing about them than I should, but um, I, 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 think, I think I see them as a kind of clay. I mean, it's a clay with a particular uh, composition and a particular disposition to being um, handled. It's like sort of beautiful, pot perfect grade china or something that you can turn into porcelain. So I, I, I just try to take this. And also I see myself, I'm, I'm very interested, actually something Borges also said, which is he said that, and, and Hisham mentioned it last night, actually, Hisham said that, um, you know, we write in the river of language. And uh, Borges said, we write in the wake of a literature. Um, and he said, uh, Borges also argued that the more people did something, that sort of the better it got, it, it sort of ripened. The whole, the whole mode ripened. And I think you could see that perhaps if you like in the English novel, the sort of silver fork novel, um, but, but, uh, which I don't do. <laughs> but, um, um, and so there is, but there's been a lineage, you know, of, women writers writing back to the fairy tale and mythic tradition. It goes back quite a long way, actually. I mean, I was thinking today, you know, I went to Hagar Kim, mm -hmm. and I was reminded of Naomi Mitchison, who was, a, you know, she was 101 when she died in 99, I think. Um, and, and she was an ex extraordinary mythologer. She wrote hundreds of books about many, a very knowledgeable person, but she wrote a very, very fine, one of her finest novels was, is a prehistoric novel in which she reconstructs prehistoric life. Um, I think it's called The Corn King and the Spring Queen, or The Corn, anyway, it's about, and it's about fertility rituals. It's a, it's a strange and sort of slightly sort of unsettling novel. But anyway, so there's, the, the tradition goes back a long way in the British Isles of women interrogating the mythic past. And of course, the towering figure is Angela Carter, but there are, there are many, many others. And so, you know, I, I like to, to try and do it myself. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the, um, and I also think that fiction is, and this was in confirmed when I was judging the Man Booker International Prize, where we read, you know, a great number of novels from all over the world. Um, fiction has become an arena of, where, of debate. Um, and that doesn't mean that it must be schematic, of course not, nor does it mean it's didactic and you know, not, no. And of course it must have, you know, to some extent, characters that are, you know, sympathetically enga en engage you, hook you in and so forth. Although not always now, I mean, there's some very fine uh, writers who perhaps don't have, well, they certainly don't have romance dramas, for example. Um, I mean, uh, Laszlo Krasna Hawkeye, who won it, doesn't do love stories at all. So the, you can have novels that do a lot of different things. Um, but it's definitely the case that people are using the novel to do a lot of different things. I mean, whereas they might have in the past have written non-fiction books, there, are, there is so much censorship and so much difficulty of access to print in so many countries now in the world that fiction offers a shelter. Fiction is, in that sense, Aesopian. You know, you, it, you, you hide under the fable of the fiction, but actually you're saying a lot of things about any, any number of matters, you know, social. So, so my, my re I, I like to try and, and, and approach dilemmas and through, through ancient stories or even quite modern fairy tales and re rework them. So uh, when moving, uh, from the voice of the mythographer and the cultural historian to the voice of the novelist. 
Is that transition a difficult one? Is it a seamless one? Or are the compositional principles, uh, do they remain the same? Do they differ in any way? The, the, um, fiction is a great freedom because unlike um, uh, 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 some kind of literary essay, you don't have to make up your mind. I mean, you, you can lay out the dilemma um, and you can leave it as a question, um, as, a, you know, as a, hideous, a hideous problem, if you like. So, <coughs> but um, in terms of my own psychology, I find it very difficult to make time for fiction because uh, I get asked to write other things and much mm -hmm. more than I get asked to write fiction, unfortunately. And um, I have numerous other things to do too. So, and clearing the space is hard. Uh, so, but when I do it, I, I do feel it's, I do feel it's m worthwhile. I mean, I feel that you, you, if you can read, you know, I, I mean, I suppose it's because as a reader, I, I, I really love a good novel. I find it really satisfying. So what is the generative spark of your fiction? Does it lie primarily in myths, fairy tales, or also uh, family sagas? Yes, I'm yes. thinking about The Lost Father, yes. not only Indigo with its Shakespearean references, or the Leto bundle. Mm. Normally, what is the generative spark, or is there? No, no, actually, no? I, I, all my novels um, have always been based in my family history. I, I was dealt this extraordinary hand, you know, by fate, mm -hmm. which is that my father was a kind of white West Indian, and my mother was Italian from the south, from actually very much the atmosphere of Malta, I mean, from Bari, um, which is almost more like Malta than, for example, Naples mm -hmm. is. Oddly enough, I don't quite know why that is, but it's, it's the case. Possibly because it's also a rectilinear city. You know, it was laid out in a, in a grid, mm -hmm. Bari, so, uh, so by, by uh, um, Napoleon's. So it's early, very early 19th century uh, grid, grid formation. You're earlier here, but anyway, it, ha it has many similarities, um, Valletta with Bari. And, um, and, oh, so, and, then, sure. and, and then, you know, unlike a lot of writers, um, who, are, who, come, who come with backgrounds that give them credentials to speak on certain matters. I mean, you know, Hisham's story is extremely, uh, is a very tragic story, but it's, uh, and it's a completely fascinating story about the disappearance of his father. But, you know, I come from a background of petty bourgeois colonialists. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so it's a, um, you know, it's a very, very different. And so I, I have always felt that I, you know, need to make a reckoning with this inheritance. Um, and so that's the spur. But I like to go through images. I like to go through tales and images at it rather than um, the, the, the direct realism. And this is your second visit to Malta. So you were mentioning Malta, comparisons with Bari. As a mythographer, cultural historian, but also as a novelist, was there anything in particular which fired your imagination? Well, you took me to the archaeological museum. Um, and um, actually, Tamim al Barghouti was there later, and we were comparing notes. And we were both very, very struck by this very early example of writing, which is mm -hmm. in Phoenician. And it's a, a little inscription yes. that was rolled up you know, on papyrus, rolled up inside a, a phylactery, a little tiny w w gold, which was worn by the corpse in a tomb. Mm -hmm. And it's a warning. It's the, it's the dead person speaking and warning anyone who, you know, who, uh, and, uh, and, and sort of talking to the gods to speak to, yes, it's a kind of challenge um, to the to speaking out from the dead. To, mm -hmm. So that I found very powerful, actually. And it's tiny. 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 And it's come all these years, all these millennia. It reverberates. All these mi millennia, mm -hmm. this voice still speaking. You know, the last line of, of its metamorphoses mm. is, is Vivam, I shall live. And you, you know, will and raise is, from the ashes. Yes, and, and this mm -hmm. idea that the word lives you know, it's such a powerful idea in literature that you can, you know, that you will continue. This, these voices are still making themselves heard. You know, and London now is just entirely obsessed with Greek tragedy. 
Uh, they're just one performance after another of different mm -hmm. forms of Antigone, Medea, the Oresteia, the Hecuba. Every company is doing them. And these are very ancient tragedies. And they are still speaking even more clearly because they're all about war and trafficking and women being, you know, mm -hmm. it's a, and it just, so this, this to me is the, you know, the absolutely irresistible, irresistible force, magnetism of this material. My last question before your next reading has to do with the importance of literature festivals. And we've heard so many different voices in so many different languages. And I was going over, I was going through once upon, upon a time, and I was struck by what you write about literature festivals in this um, history of fairy tales. And you say that literature was a speech act performed by living voices to their audiences as in many public events nowadays when literary festivals put pressure on writers to transform themselves into public performers. So can you tell us what you think about literature festivals and also the importance that they give to voicing, voicing as an art of living creators? Well, the, one of the things that's striking about, uh, if you take the longue durée of, of literature, is that a, a huge amount of literature was written for, I mean, oratory, love poetry, song, tragedy, uh, funeral orations, were written for the, vo for, I mean, they were written. So this, the, 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 the conflict between what's called oratory and literature is far too stark. Um, there was a lot of oral transmission but the texts were written. I mean, Homer is ex obvious example. But um, and f it's only really a sh very short period when pe when silent reading uh, came in, in without any form of voice, actually a, a spoken voice. And just in my lifetime, this has changed. I mean, when I first started writing, there were very few literature. The hair on why was an absolute gleam in someone's eye. I mean, it was very. I remember someone asking me in London, in about 1975. If we have a lunchtime uh, readings of writers, do you think anyone will come? You know, this is the Institute of Contemporary Arts, and he had come from America. He said, we do these things in America. Do you think it would go down here? I said, I doubt it. You know? <laughs> 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 and the idea of anyone going to lunch to hear, for lunchtime to hear a writer read, not a poet, a writer, a you writer. know. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, a writer of fiction. So, um, anyway, it's now everywhere. There isn't, a, there isn't a museum or gallery in London that doesn't have lunchtime readings, and, and, the, and the festival trade, as you know, is enormous. So, and so we have all had to become much more, much better at reading or putting ourselves out and talking and, and uh, I mean, I think it's a good thing, and I very much like being here, and I like meeting other writers and, you know, hearing them. And, no, I think it's excellent to have... Uh, the, it builds the community. It's important. It's a part of the crisscrossing, part of the dialogue. So, to conclude our conversation, <laughs> uh, would you kindly read to us um, an excerpt or a short story from uh, your forthcoming book, Fly Away Home? Yes, th thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, yes. The title comes from a nursery rhyme, Ladybird, Ladybird, Fly Away Home, Your House is on Fire, Your Children Alone. Um, and this story in that book um, is called uh, Sing For Me. And the reason I'm reading it to you is because it has a buried uh, theme of St. John the Baptist and Salome. And of course, I saw the painting in the cathedral this time. Um, the epigraph to the story is from Tacitus. And it's, they make a desert and call it peace. In those days, the rumor started there would be an inquiry. Full and frank disclosure, the government kept hinting. A tribunal of independent adjudicators and observers. Independent observers. They'd look into the events thoroughly and into the sequence of events that led to them, into the decisions and actions that led to those particular events on that day. 
The correct name for what happened was Operation Light of Day. That was what the history books will call it. But my husband, the captain procurator, always referred to it as the maneuvers. I used to say the mistake, but I avoided talking about it then, and I still don't like to dwell on it now. Maya, she called those events the outrage. I so wished she wouldn't. An inquiry had been going on all along, of course, beneath the surface. Not yet officially, but questions were the stuff we breathed, except that we didn't breathe. At home, Maya might as well have not been there. She was always in her room, on her machine, writing, writing. When she did talk to me, she'd argue. We have to find out so that there won't be a next time, so that it stops. Any progress towards peace has to start by finding out who did it and what exactly they did, how many people, how many died. But my husband, he wouldn't see it that way. He'd ruminate. Robust, full, frank disclosure, transparency, yes, of course. But then he'd start qualifying this and qualifying that, and Maya would get angry with her father till he'd say to her, that's what we're told that self-examination is the gold standard of democracy. That is what the government wants, and we agree. I agree. Every nation on this earth should be accountable and transparent. Absolutely. But there's a limit to all this fessing up. Some things should be known and some things not. Some things should be said and some things. I've told them, no way will I give the inquiry the go-ahead here. For the people who lived there, in that place where the mistake happened, the events are known by the name of the place that was once their home, are somewhere of little importance till then, a place nobody in their right mind would have wanted to go, let alone live, until the mistake put it on the map, you could say, and the world's media descended on it. By then, there wasn't much of it left at all, though now there is a bit more. It's being rebuilt by our forces, with help from NGOs, of course. So basically, she finds out that her daughter is, um, is, is a sort of clandestine activist. She finds it out because um, her daughter is in a band, and she's always out at night playing in her band. But she finds it out because when she's out one night, she um, goes into her room and, and, and use, looks up her face, Facebook. And she finds on the Facebook a blog that her daughter is writing. There it was on her screen some kind of blog she was writing under a strange name. Bring friends home to meet my father. He used to show me his campaign medals. He used to stand to attention and march up and down while I stood up in my nappies and clapped him and gurgled. He'd shown me that home video over and over. Sometimes he'd take his gun out of the locked cupboard in his study and hand it to me to feel its weight and its coldness. Or he'd get his sidearm out of the holster and tip out the bullets and then spin the chamber and give it to me to hold while it was spinning and it was warm from his hands, and you could see how he loved it, loved his gun. Oh God, when I saw what she was up to, we should have seen it coming. No, that's not right. I should have seen it coming. I did, but I didn't admit it to myself. I couldn't, not then. It was unimaginable. Though her actions were by no means isolated. She was part of a trend, a movement, they called it. They wanted openness, truth, they said. She was writing to her friends. They've been inquiries in other places. They make it possible to move on. We know lots now. We know what they don't tell us. They do things and they don't think about what they do. What it means for us who have to live with the outrage. There's a bit more of it then. I was really frightened what he would do if he knew that she would be the one who gets hurt. I was trembling, but something in me was excited too. It was a few days later, and we were watching the news. Or rather, Maya was watching with me. We were quiet, together, even happy. The captain procurator wasn't home. He was on a mission. And the newsreader began announcing that new evidence had been made available about Operation Light of Day on April the 12th, that terrible year, 13 years ago. And we saw him. He was facing a man who was waving his hands in the air. I wasn't sure. No, that's not it. I wanted not to be sure. And she, 
Well, she was a little girl. She used to squill with the thrill of it when she glimpsed her father in the gunship, sitting in the tail with his machine gun between his knees, or when he was talking on camera after an operation. No, that now, though, I could see that she knew that even though he was so much younger, it was still her father in the shot. He was the man with the gun, and he's holding it in the face of an old man who's waving both his hands in the air, and his hands are empty. The captain, my husband, is younger, and the film's jumpy and a bit fuzzy, but it's him. He came back, and he said to her, it'll be my birthday soon. I'm going to be 45 years old, 45, an old man. I want you to do something for me. His voice was soft and kind. The day you were born, I was away. I heard the news on the phone in the camp. I remember I cried, I cried, I did. Go on, cheer up your old father on his birthday. Sing something for me. You used to sing. You sing so nicely when you want to. Sing for me, an old song, a song I remember from when I was your age. That way, I'll feel young again. She was smiling, she was playing to his tune. And for a moment, I was tranquil. We were going to be a family again. She said, and if I sing, Father, will you give me something I really want? Of course, he said, anything. I swear by everything that's holy. He was laughing, and he would have given her the moon and the stars. He offered her a car, an iPod, you name it. But she was shaking her head, still smiling. No, nothing like that, she said. I want something instead that means something to you, to us all. That's my girl. He was beaming. I could feel her fierceness like a riptide rising, and he was in the water, and he didn't know it. I felt a hollow under my ribs, and a bird caged there flew up and out, and I was holding onto her arm, my daughter's arm, and walking with her towards him, and I didn't let go but squeezed her and felt how thin her whole frame is, my daughter's body so thin when she went up to him and she put her hand in his and told him he had to testify. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, this thank was you. wonderful. Thank you, Marina. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Gloria, thank very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.